a training today on um, account creation and uh, running through some permits. And then we also have our GIS team on the call that's going to be going through some more like routing uh, specific training as well. And then we'll wrap up with the kind of a Q&A uh, section just in case there's any questions that come up during the training. That being said, though, we do have um, some of our team on the line here. So if you have any questions while we're going through the training and you want to go ahead and put them in the chat, feel free. Um, we have some people that will um, try to respond during the training as well. So um, let me go ahead and pull up my screen so we can uh, take a look at what we got going on here. OK, so like I said, um, we're going to be creating some accounts and running through some permits and then looking at routing. Um, I'm going to be doing all of this in our uh, test website because I don't want to create any accounts um, on the production side of things. So if there's any kind of weirdness or we run into any issues during the training, uh, just know that this is the test environment. Um, all of you should already have uh, login credentials to get into the production environment, but I do just want to go ahead and point out um, we have our support email address here. If you log in, if you're trying to log into the production site and you're having issues with your password or anything like that, go ahead and just send us an email and we'll um, get you situated so you can get logged into the system. So I'm going to log in. Um, here we go, get to the dashboard. And like I said, um, the first thing we want to look at today is setting up accounts. Um, there's a few different account types, so we'll take a look at those. To create an account, you're going to uh, click this Create Plus button up here at the top, and you're going to click this Company link. Uh, this will bring you to a page where uh, you can select which account, which account type you will be creating. Uh, there's a few options here. If you have a, if there's a USDOT for the company you're creating, you would be selecting the first option. If there is no USDOT, you would select the second option. And if you're creating um, like a government entity uh, account, you would select this last one. Um, we're going to start with the government uh, agency account, so I'm going to select that. And then click Create Account. This will bring you to a page where you can enter in all of the uh, company information. And since this is a, a government entity for the Eastern Region, I'm going to go ahead and um, enter that information in. So I'm going to do the, the name. I'm going to put my email address for uh, demo purposes. And do the phone number. Um, grab that. Enter the address. You do have the option here to check this box if uh, the physical address is the same as the mailing address. I'm going to do that and it just copies it over. And then since this is a, a government entity, um, you don't need to create a user for this account. So I'm going to check this box, this create account without login box. It will gray out all these fields so you don't have to enter any user information. Since you're you know, creating this government entity and you're going to be issuing permits to it, we don't need to actually log into the account. That's the reason for, for checking this box. So I think I have all my information filled out here. So I'm going to click Create Company. And then you'll see here, um, since this is a government entity that you're creating, it does require approval from the permit office. So this message just kind of lets you know that, hey, you've created it, but it's pending approval. And you'll be notified once the permit office approves the account for uh, issuing permits. So um, Kit or Chaz, I'm not sure who is on right now, but um, whenever you get a second, um, go ahead and approve that account that I just created in test. And we'll uh, get back to it after we um, finish creating the accounts we're going to be setting up during this training. Yes, sir. Give me just a second and that account will be approved. OK, OK, for sure. Thank you. Um, so while uh, while Kit is doing that, I want to go ahead and show you what the process is like if you're going to be setting up an account for a, a customer with a USDOT. So I went ahead and um, went back to that create and then create company link. And I'm brought back to that page with the options. 
Um, I'm going to select, I have a USDOT number this time. And then you would enter that USDOT, you would click search. And then um, the system will automatically bring in that company and all the relevant information. Um, it gives you a, a message here just to confirm that this is the correct account you're trying to create. Um, I'm going to hit create account. And it's going to bring me back to that page that I entered all that information in before for the government entity. But since I'm using a USDOT this time, it just brings in um, all that information pre-populated. So you can see a uh, company name, the phone number, all the address information, all that fun stuff is there. Um, I'm going to remove this email because I don't want to spam anybody um, from our test site. I'm going to put in my email address there. <laughs> And then once again, um, I'm going to go ahead and create this one without uh, a user associated with the account. And it just grays out all those fields because you're just creating the account to issue the permits to. Um, this is this process is pretty straightforward since everything's pre-populated. So I'm going to click Create Company. And since this one has a USDOT and it pulled in all that information, um, it just automatically gets created, doesn't require any approval from the permit office, and permits can be issued to that company immediately. So that's the create account process. Um, there is one more. Um, if you if you're creating a company for uh, if you're creating an account for a company that doesn't have a USDOT number, you would select this second option, and then. Um, the page would be, uh, you could just enter in all the information manually. Um, but since we already kind of went through that process with the government entity, um, we'll go ahead and uh, move on. Yep, George, your uh, account has been approved. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, so since that account has been approved, I'm gonna go ahead and pull it up. Um, so I did one for the Eastern region. So searching for that account, you can pull up the company management. Uh, we want to look at a few things that you can do here. Um, you'll see whenever you pull up the, the company information, it defaults to the company info page, which just has the name, the email address for the contact information, and then the phone number that was entered. Um, you can see that this company has exempt allowed, so any uh, permits that are issued to this company will not have fees. Uh, that's what exempt allowed means. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and look at company assets and what we can do here. Um, you'll have that address information that you entered during the account creation process. You can um, look at it, you can edit it, you can update it. Um, you do have the option to create terminals here. So to do that, um, you would click this create new link. You would enter some information about um, that terminal. It's going to do Office 1. Of course, you can name the terminals whatever you want. You enter um, the contact information related to that terminal. So email address, a phone number, and what the, the delivery method should be. I'm going to just do email. Once you have all that terminal information filled out, you click the Submit button to actually add that terminal to this account. Um, and then, of course, you can pull up the the terminal and edit any information as you need, um, and you can add additional ones as well. So if you create new, you can do an office two, let's just say for simplicity's sake. Enter in that contact information. We'll do web download for this one. And then you can see you'll have the two um, terminals in your account. So it's kind of a, you know, an overview of how to create the terminals. It's pretty simple. Um, the other thing I want to show here that's kind of also, you can uh, see how terminals will be related to this, is uh, creating a vehicle. If you want to add a vehicle to the inventory for this company, um, so you can select it during the permit application process, you can uh, click this Create New button, and it will give you all the fields to entering the vehicle information. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and add one for this company so we can see it whenever we create a permit. 
Um, so you enter the unit number, uh, the make, year, bin, late state. If there's a registered GVW, a Washington registered GVW, you can enter that as well. You can assign um, a terminal, like I created the those two just now. I can uh, assign this vehicle to one of those terminals and then select a uh, vehicle type. Once you have all your vehicle information entered, you click that submit button and that will add the vehicle to the inventory for this specific company. So you can see here, that's the vehicle I just added. And of course you can come in and edit these as needed. Okay. So that's um, some company management aspects that you can do with the accounts that you uh, end up creating. Uh, now we're gonna move to uh, creating a few different uh, permits so we can see what those pages look like and um, what paying for them looks like too, since uh, the we created a government entity one, which is a little bit different uh, than a regular customer. So let's go ahead and start a new permit. So you're gonna do create up here at the top, create uh, a new permit. I'm gonna select company from this search so I can um, issue a permit to that exempt, that government entity I just created. Um, So there's a Eastern region, select that. Um, the first page of the permit application is gonna be the, the contact information. This is gonna pull in some information from the account, um, but it can be changed if, uh, if needed. You do need to enter a contact name. I'm just gonna enter my name. Um, we do have this company reference field down here. This isn't required, but it can allow you to uh, track the permits maybe in a different way if you have like a job number or some other number that you want to associate this permit to you can enter it down here and you can search um, for that company reference later on if needed so i'm going to click next then we're going to select our permit type um, for this first permit i'm going to do um, one of the government vehicles permits there we go so you select that from the drop down. It gives you a little uh, description just so you know what this permit type is used for. Um, down here, you can um, select your start date. It defaults to today's date, but you can um, select a date in the future if uh, if needed. That's everything I need for that page. When you click next, you're brought to the vehicles page. Um, you do have these fields here that you can enter manually. If you're uh, issuing a permit to a vehicle you don't have in your inventory, but you do have the option to select a vehicle from your inventory as well. So you saw me add this one earlier to this account. So I'm gonna just select that. And then um, you can see that information just gets auto-populated there for the, for the vehicle. I'll we'll click next. And then um, on your load details page, most of this is pre-populated for this specific permit type. Um, you can see we have the load description. You have a field for the width, which you do have to enter a width, but then the height, the overall length, the trailer load length, overhangs, all that stuff is pre-populated. And then down here, you do have to enter the GVW for the vehicle. For this one, I'm gonna enter 108,000. So after you do uh, your dimensions, you're brought to the axle weight and spacings page. Um, so there is an option here at the top. I don't know, honestly, if you guys uh, use the axle spacings reports from the old system, but if you do, um, there is an option to import them. Um, you will need to know that report number, and then you have an option here to include the weights or not, it's up to you. Um, and then you would click load, and then it would be populated with 
um, the spacing and weight from that axle spacing report. Um, it's populated, but you can edit it. Edit it. Edit it. Sorry. <laughs> um, if you if you need to. But for this one, I'm just going to go ahead and enter my axle weights and spacings manually. Let's see here for my vehicle. I have looks like I have 18,000 across the board on weights. And I got to enter my spacings. So you see you can just tab through the rows and enter the spacings in between each axle and then the weight for each one. So four, six. And then. This one is 27. 18,000 and then the last one is just four. And then you can select the, the number of tires. It looks like this vehicle does have this uh, default where it's just two tires for the first one and four tires for the rest. Uh, my tread width, let's see this first one is 18. These next three are 16 inches. So I'm gonna select those. And then my last two axles are 18. And then you do have the option to uh, change the axle type if needed to. Um, so that's uh, my axle weights and spacings for this uh, for this vehicle. I'm gonna click next. And then you're brought to the conditions page. This just prints any of the specific conditions that apply to this permit. Um, since you are a state user, you do have the option to edit them or delete any. Click next. Um, since this is being issued to that government entity that I created and got approved by kit, um, you can see that the, the fee for this is zero. And then here we have the summary page. It just kind of puts everything that we went through in the permit application on one page so you can review it before you submit it. You can see the, the company that we are issuing this permit to, the fees, which is zero in this case. Uh, the contact information, the permit type, the duration information, vehicles, uh, vehicle information, the dimensions, the axle weights and spacings that we entered, the conditions that were on the previous page, and uh, that's it. It just kind of gives you everything so you can look, look over it before submitting. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. You can see here um, it's the status is set to approve since there's no payment needed and you do have the option to just print it immediately. Um, so I'm going to click this issue and print permits button. And you can see here it brings you to this permit to be authorized page. There's no permit fee. Um, so you just check the acknowledgement and click the print permits button. No payment is collected. So I'm going to do that. And then it brings you to this page. This uh, permit is now issued, so we have a permit number, and then we have a link here to to download and view the permit PDF, which looks like this. Of course, we have the watermark here because we're in the test environment, but it gives you an idea of what the the PDF will look like. So there we go. That's a, a government vehicles permit issued to a government entity, so it didn't have any fees. We can see the payment method is uh, exempt here at the top. OK, um, so let's go ahead and order another permit. We'll do a different uh, permit type and we'll issue it to a different uh, type of company as well. So let me get that process started. For this one, I'm going to issue um, one of the farm implements uh, permits, and I'm going to do it to just a regular non-commercial carrier. Um, so I'm going to search for one of my companies, um, we'll do George's Farms, because we're doing a farm implements uh, permit. We'll select that. Enter the contact information. Of course, like I said before, you can edit this if needed. And then we're going to do the farm implements farmer. So I'm going to select the monthly annual option. And then in this drop down, we should have the farm implements farmer. So I'm going to select that. 
and it gives you that uh, permit description. For this one, uh, there's a few different uh, durations you can select three months, six months, or a year. I'm just going to do half a year. Click next. Uh, most of the information for this permit type is pre populated, so you can see on our load details page, there isn't really anything to enter. It just tells you what this permit is for in terms of width, height, and length, and overhang. So click next. This page is a little different. Um, since this is one of those farm implements uh, permits, you do have uh, a page to select which counties this permit applies to. Um, you can select one or several or all. Uh, I'm just going to do I'm just going to do one for this permit. Click next. And then we have the conditions. You'll see that these conditions are a little bit different than the government vehicles one because this is a different permit type. So there's different conditions by default. And then um, since I'm issuing this permit to uh, you know, a company that's not exempt or not a government agency will have uh, actual fees on it. So on the fees page, you can see this permit is $20. And then click next and that's um that brings us to the summary page it, like i said before just kind of outlines everything here on one page so you can review it you can see we have the the county that we selected earlier okay so i'm going to approve this one um so after this is approved it gets set to pending payment which is uh Different than the one before it was set to approve. This one is pending payment because it's $20 and it requires payment. At this point, it's in the customer shopping cart so they can pay for it. Or if you're collecting payment, you can um, click the pay for the permits now button. And then it'll bring you to a page to select uh, how you're collecting payment for this permit. Your options are going to be cash or check if you're collecting the payment. Uh, cash is pretty straightforward if you select check you have to enter a check number. I do kind of want to stress here on this page. Um, it is important to make sure you're logged in to only like one browser tab when you're making, when you're like processing a payment like this. Um, if you're logged into multiple tabs, uh, it, it won't have um, this payment type option. Um, so, but it's easy. You just need to close out all your browser tabs reopen your browser, log in, and make sure you're just in the one tab whenever you're processing the payment. Uh, I'm going to do cash and do my acknowledgement. So that permit is now paid for. It brings you to the page that has the permit number since it's issued now, and then the little icon to download the PDF. For the farm implements, uh, Permit, the first page is pretty similar. The first page for most of the permits is pretty similar. But of course, the farm implements does have this letter that comes along with it. So um, that's included in the permit PDF. Um, See, so yeah, it has my information and then the county that was selected and all the contact information down here. And then the rest of it is the, the static documents that get tacked on to the end, too. Um, yeah, so that's the farm implements permit. I'm going to go back home and then we're going to do um, one more uh, permit type. We're just going to do kind of a, a regular oversize overweight. Um, walk through that and then after we'll after that we'll um, hand it off to GIS to kind of do a more in depth uh, section on routing. I'm just going to do a basic route when we get to that point. So I'm going to start the process. Um, let's see here. I'm going to issue this permit to that uh, account I created earlier. So let me grab that DOT. OK, there we go. That's the one I created earlier that had a USDOT. I'm going to select that company. You can see we'll do, we do a prism check here in the background. 
page is the same as before. Contact information with the company reference if needed. And like I said, we're going to do a, a single trip oversize overweight for this last one. Um, you can change the duration date for this one as well if you need to select a date in the future. Um, there is that option for you. Click next. Oh yeah, since I didn't create, um, since I didn't add any vehicles to that company, this one does not have anything in the inventory, but I can just add um, vehicle information here. So I'm gonna do that real quick. Let's see, use that VIN I already have. Wait. So I just entered all the vehicle information manually, including the registered GVW and the vehicle type. Um, all, like I said before, all of these fields you can um, enter in when you're adding a vehicle to your vehicle inventory. Um, but there I have it all entered. When you click next, there's this cool option. Um, well, first it does this uh, uh, check against the Washington system in terms of what their registered GVW is versus what was entered on the permit. Um, you can click OK. That's just informational. Um, this is pretty cool. Um, if you enter a vehicle that is not in your vehicle inventory, it gives you the option to save it. So next time you issue a permit and you're needing to select that vehicle, you don't have to enter in all the fields again. Or you can continue without saving if you know you're never going to you know, issue a, a permit to this vehicle. OK. So for an oversize overweight permit, we do have a, quite a few uh, fields to fi fill out here. Um, so you got to select your commodity type and do construction equipment. And do screen for the load description. And then I'm going to enter my dimensions. Looks like I'm 10 feet wide, 15 feet high. My length, overall length is 80. Trailer load length is 65. I don't have any overhangs. So that's all my dimensions entered. So I'm going to click next and get to the axle spacings page. This vehicle has some more more axles, so I'm going to do looks like I have nine. And of course, like I said before, if you if, if there's a axle spacing report for that vehicle from East Snoopy, you can uh, click this button up here and enter in that report number and load it in. But I'm going to enter in my axles. Uh, let's see here. First axles 20. And 10, 2, 13, 5. Oops, 3, 6, 5, 10. Looks like most of the rest of these are 20,000. Missed that one, 20,000. And then this last one is 15,000. Looks like my vehicle has a couple um, axles that have two tires, so I need to go ahead and change that. So two tires and axle three has two tires as well. And then you're going to need to select uh, the tread width and looks like the tread width for this vehicle is metric. So I'm going to scroll down to get to the metric values. Looks like my first one is 425 and then these two are both 295. So I'm going to select those. There we go. So that's my actual information. I'm going to click next. And continue. OK, so now I'm on the route page. Like I said earlier, we have GIS on the line that's going to give us a more in-depth uh, look at what you can do with routing. But for my permit, I'm just going to do um, just a simple like mile post to border crossing route. 
Um, you'll see if you select milepost as your location type, you'll get um, all of the, the rows that can be selected. And then you can select your direction, and if you know your specific milepost, you can just go ahead and enter that. And then I'm going to end on I-5 as well. So once you have your origin and destination information entered, you can just click route. Uh, when the system finds, when the system generates a route, um, you'll see you'll get the blue line on the map. All, all the restrictions will be in red here. And like I said, you asked, we'll kind of uh, give you a more in-depth look at what this what this is. Um, hey, George, can I say something real quick? Yeah, of course. What's up? Hey, can you zoom into the origin on that? I just want to note that yeah. George had selected northbound I-5. And so the system's very specific about the direction. So it's going to take him north to the next exit and then loop him back around south to the border. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Great. That's it. Okay, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, so once we have the, the route generated, um, there's a few other things here on the, the route page. Um, we have a dimension section so you can see um, what dimensions were used to generate that route, and then the actual um, weights and spacings that were entered to. And we have uh, driving directions, uh, a route description, any um, conditions that are on that route, the turn by turn directions, and then since this is an over since this is an oversize and overweight uh, permit, we do have a field to enter the whatever the local mileage might be, so that is included in the so that gets included in the fee. So I believe that's everything I need on the route page. And click next. Uh, this will bring you to the conditions page, which, like uh, like I've been saying, has the specific conditions to this permit and has uh, any route specific conditions to are are listed here. Um, and click next. Then we have our, our fees page, which uh, kind of breaks down um, how that fee is calculated. You can see the different uh, weight values, what the excess is, and then what the rate is, what rate is being charged um, to get to your total. And um, like I said before, anytime you enter local mileage, of course, that's included in this uh, this total here. So that's um, the process for oversized overweight. We're here on the summary page, breaks everything down. Um, that fee page we just looked at, contact information, permit type, vehicle information, all that fun stuff. Um, it also includes the route since this is a single trip permit. You can see uh, the route on the summary page as well. So that looks good. Uh, I'm going to do approve. And um, it's set to pending payment. So like I said before, when, when it's pending payment, it's in the customer's cart, or you can um, pay for it if you're collecting payment. I'm going to do a uh, check this time, and then we got to enter the check number. Click the acknowledgment, and then uh, process that payment. That permit's now issued, and then we can um, view the PDF. Of course, since this is, a, this is an oversized, overweight uh, single trip permit, um, there's quite a bit of stuff here. We have the axle weights here. We have the route information, any conditions that apply, the fee breakdown, the turn by turn directions are included on the PDF as well, and then the standard attachments. OK. Um, so those are the three permit types I was going to issue. Um, before we hand it over to GIS, we did want to just show um, the process for voiding a permit, too. So I'm going to go back home, and I'm going to pull up that permit I just issued. So that's the permit ID. You search for the permit ID, and then that pulls up your permit details. And we have a big void button over here. <laughs> um, so you're going to click that. 
it gives you um, the void policy. It uh, has a field for you to enter a replacement permit number if you have one. And then you do have to uh, do these two acknowledgements to, to actually process the void. Um, since I am the person that issued this permit, I do have this um, acknowledgement that I have to um, check that, hey, I am the person who issued this and <laughs> I'm the only person able to do this. So um, we have that there. And then you have a field to enter the reason for the void. Um, I'm just going to do a simple issued an error. And once you acknowledge those two things and then you have a, uh, a reason entered, the confirm void button will be enabled. And you click that and then it gets voided. Um, so you can see the status is is void and then your void reason is going to be added as a as a note to the permit here. So in the permit details, you click the notes tab and then you'll see whatever the you'll see what was entered for the void reason. OK. So that is uh, my portion. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand it over to GIS to give us a more in-depth look at the, the routing page and what all you can do on there. So I think Kaylin is doing that for us. Um, so. Yep, I'll go ahead and share my screen. I, oh, let's see. I did just want to preface with a few things. Um, I've already let PMT know my mic has a tendency to go in and out. So for whatever reason, it seems like I just stop talking and drop off the face of the planet. PMT is just going to let me know so I can kind of readjust that for you guys. Um, we also normally have more GIS people on the call, but today it's just me and Amanda. So if for whatever reason you do put something in the chat, I'm not going to be able to see it while I'm demoing. So if she doesn't get it, get to it, um, we will address any chats that are not um, answered after I'm done with the demo. So just wanted to start off by that, um, but I'm just going to start here on the route page. This is from y'all's perspective. This is not going to be from a customer perspective, um, just so you can kind of see what y'all's abilities are going to be on this page. Um, so when you first get onto the page, this is what it's going to look like. You're going to have your origin and your destination. Those are both going to be blank. And you'll see whenever you click the location type for either of those, there's going to be a few different options here. We have an address, an intersection, lat long, border crossing, and a mile post. So I'm going to go through each and every one of those with you guys and kind of show you a little bit more in depth on the routing page, um, some different functions that we have. So for this first permit, I'm just going to start off at our origin. I'm going to use an address. So I am going to copy an address on Washington 26 in Royal City. And pasted that in there. For my destination, I'm going to use an intersection. So under destination location type, I'm going to choose intersection, which is right under address. I'm going to click that. You'll see that it go ahead and populates um, street one, street two, and a city. None of them are set because we haven't found them yet. So we're going to go ahead and then click find this intersection button. So I'm going to click that. You'll see it kind of just gives you um, sort of a centered look at the map. You'll see under map we have intersection of street one, street two, and a city, which is optional. So I'm going to go ahead and put for street one, I'm going to put Washington 21, street two, I'm going to put Washington 20, and um, I do not have a city for this particular intersection. So I have Washington 21, Washington 20, and once I have all of that filled out, I'm going to hit this find button. And what the system is going to do is it's going to search for any um, intersections where those two roads meet. So looks like it found two here. Um, it depends on how you want to produce the route, but you'll go in and zoom in and just verify whichever balloon you do pick makes sense for your route. Um, for this one, I'm going to choose this first balloon. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in and click it. You'll see that now instead of that little one balloon, it populates a red destination balloon marked with that little um, D there. 
So once I've chosen my destination, I'm going to hit done up here in the right hand corner. I click done. And you'll see that this is some auto uh, auto populates this info. So we have the intersection of Washington 21 and Washington 20 in Republic. So now that I have my origin address, my destination intersection, I'm going to go ahead and click route. And the system's going to think, keep in mind, the system is going to take in all the information you've given it. So at the moment, I have our dimensions fairly low. Um, I have an 8 foot 6 width, an overall length of 45, and a height at 14.8. This is just an oversized permit. So it's going to take in all your dimensions as well as just any um, restrictions on the route, and it's going to give you the route that it thinks is more preferred. So something to keep in mind is that our system, unless already spoken about with Washington, is going to um, prefer interstates, then U.S. highways, and then Washington routes. Um, there are some instances where the state has come back and told us, hey, we'd really prefer this highway over this highway, and we'll make those adjustments there. But for the most part, unless there's a restriction on the route or something like that, the system is going to prefer interstates, U.S. highways, and then Washington routes. So I have my route. We'll see that we have our origin balloon, our destination balloon, and we have our blue route line. Um, so I'm just going to show you a few things that you can do with the map and the overall routing page. Um, the first thing that I'm going to show you guys is I'm going to zoom in and let's just say you're curious about a restriction on the route. So all of our restrictions are going to have this red restriction highlight um, just to signify that there is a restriction on that road segment. So even though this doesn't really have anything to do with the route, I'm just going to go in and zoom in here just because this is a pretty long red highlight. And I'm just curious about what restriction is on Washington 821. So I'm going to go in. I'm going to zoom in to the road that I'm looking at. I'm going to go to this get restriction information for road button. I'm going to toggle that radio button and I'm going to select the road. From there, you're going to see all of the different types of restrictions that are on this road. Um, we have a no permits restriction. We have a few manufactured home restrictions, all that good stuff. Um, for now, I'm just going to go ahead and close out of this, but that's just how you can use that get restriction information um, for road button to view restrictions. I will show you how to override a restriction here in a moment. So I'm going to X out of this. You can either just use this X button or you can close. And I'm going to put myself back to drag map up here in the left hand corner. Another really cool function we have on the routing page is we have a few different on system uh, or a few different layers here on the map. We have our on system layer, which you can toggle on and off. Obviously, um, you guys know that Washington only permits on state maintained roads, which are those interstates, um, US highways and Washington highways. So anything with this green highlight is what you guys can route on. If for whatever reason you want to turn it off, you can toggle that on and off. I know some people have said that their eyesight's not super great, so sometimes they have a hard time reading the road, so they just want to toggle that off to read it and then toggle it back on when they're done. Um, another really cool function we have is the regions and maintenance areas, which you can toggle on and then you can just kind of hover over each area and it'll tell you about what that region is. I'm going to toggle that back off. Another thing um, that you can toggle on and off, I don't suggest it, but you can if you wanted to, was you can toggle on and off your restriction highlights. That'll um, make them go from red. And then we have our cross bridges layer as well, which will um, just show all the bridges crossed on your route. So those are some different. Let's see. Oop, this is a test site, so sometimes we do get our server um, messages. There we go. I'm just going to go ahead and reroute and refresh us really quick just to. Verify we're all good there. OK, 
So those are a few different layers that we have on the map. Um, another cool function that you can do with the map is you can turn it to satellite view if for whatever you wanted, uh, for whatever reason you wanted to see that. Um, I'm going to put this back to map. You can, if you're ever curious about what something looks like on Google, you can zoom into the area that you're curious about. Over here in this bottom left hand corner, there's this little Google symbol. You can click that and it's interactive and will bring you to that area in Google. You can also use what we call endearingly our little peg man. You can grab him from over here, drop him onto a road, and that's just going to give you the street view of that area. You'll even see we have our little origin balloon there. So you can kind of take a look around if for whatever reason you're curious about that. I'm going to get out of street view. Um, another thing you can do, of course, is you can toggle this to full screen. And then you can either use this little toggle or escape button to get out of it. You can zoom in and out with your scroll wheel or you can use the zoom in and out buttons. It's kind of up to you. So those are a few things that you can um, kind of play around with while you're routing that we have as functions with layers and the routing map and all that good stuff. So now that we've kind of gone over some basics on the map itself, I'll go ahead and move to our second trip. So I'm going to come back up to trip entry and this time I want to use the origin of a lat long. So I'm going to come down here. It's right under intersection. I'm going to choose lat long. For lat long, there's two different ways that you can do this. If you have a lat long that you just want to go ahead and paste into the lat long, you can go ahead and do that. If you're not 100% sure where you're starting off at, we can use this find button. So I'm going to click find for this example. And you'll see that we have a focus city here. You don't have to use the focus city. You can just zoom in and out if you want to. But for this case, I know that I want to start out in Ritzville. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I plugged in Ritzville. I'm going to hit go. And it's just going to center me near Ritzville. I'm going to zoom in on where I think I want to start, which I think I'm just going to start here at this ramp. Of course, um, like we said earlier, we do want to make sure we're choosing a green highlighted road to make sure we're starting on an on system. So I'm going to use this select radio button again, and I'm just going to click on the ramp where we want to start. And you'll see that pops up my little green origin balloon. Once I'm happy with where we're starting, I'm going to hit done. And you'll see that it auto populates that lat long there. For my destination, I'm going to choose a border crossing. So I'm going to go in to the border crossing. It's under lat long and you'll see it has a drop down. These are all pre approved roads that you can exit and enter Washington on. So for my destination, I'm just going to be exiting into Oregon on I-205. So that's the one I'm going to choose. Now that I'm happy with my origin and destination, I'm going to go ahead and route. And once again, the system is just going to take in to consideration your origin, your destination, any um, restrictions that might be along the route, and it's going to give you the route that it thinks is best for you. So you'll see once again, we have our origin and our destination, and you'll see if we zoom into our origin here, it kind of takes us off here for a second onto 395 and these two Washington roads. And if you're wondering why it does that, you see we do have two restrictions um, here in red. If you look here, it looks like um, originally we're wanting to go westbound. So it's this westbound restriction here. If I want to look into what's causing it and potentially approve the restriction, once again, I can use this get restriction information for road button click the red highlight and it'll give me every restriction on this road. For this particular restriction, we have a height here. Um, we have 14.7, we are 14.8, so the system is going to stop us. Um, for this particular route, of course, we're not um, typically going to be overriding heights, but just to show you guys how you can approve a restriction, I'm just going to go ahead and approve this restriction to get us onto I-90 and we'll have to enter an override reason. So I'm going to hit 
test just because we're testing. I have my approved. I have my override reason. Keep in mind that this restriction and your override reason will both print on the permit PDF. So just make sure that your override reason makes sense and has all of the um, necessary details that you would want to go on to the PDF. Um, obviously, it'll depend on your workflow, but some people like to put who approved it by like putting their initials. It kind of just depends on what your office decides to do, but that's something to keep in mind. So now that I've approved it and I have my override reason, I'm going to go ahead and rerun my trip. And the system is going to take into account that I have now approved that restriction and it's going to reroute me through that restriction. You'll see we have this little balloon here. It's just letting you know that we do have a restriction on the route that we overrode. So that is something to keep in mind with approving restrictions. Um, another thing that you can kind of keep in mind when it comes to routing is, you know, we often get told like, hey, this is really not my preferred route. Um, I know why the system is wanting me to go onto an interstate or a US highway rather than this Washington road, um, but I know the area better and I would really prefer to go on a route that the system is not taking me. If that is ever the case, there's a few ways you can do that. So for instance, um, in this particular route, I'm just gonna say that for whatever reason, we wanna hop off I-90 in this area, and we'd rather just take some Washington roads and then hop back on near McDonald. There's a few ways you can do this. Um, we can go to our trip entry and we can add a via point under via point types, there's going to be two different options. There's going to be a highway option and there's going to be a find on map option. The highway option is um, less preferred in most people's minds. This is more of just a suggestion. If you want um, the system to really go with what you're wanting, the find on map option and then the drag route option, which I will show you all in a moment, are definitely the preferred way. But if you do choose via highways, you would just simply type out your route and press route again, and the system will try to accommodate it. Like I said, this is more just a suggestion than it is um, a foolproof way of getting your route. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to find on map, and I'm gonna use the find on map hyperlink. Once again, we have a focus city here. If you wanna give the focus city, you can. If not, you can scroll. For this, I'm just going to go ahead and scroll because I have an idea of where I want to go. So I'm going to now choose the select to radio button and I'm just going to plot some points on the road that I would prefer the system to take. So I'm going to plot a point here on Washington 21. You'll see that I get this little blue what we call via point and it's going to have a number one because it's my first one on the route. Now I want to take Washington 26, so I'm going to plot another point on Washington 26. You'll see we get a little two via point. And then just for good measure, it would probably do what I wanted it to do regardless, but I'm just going to plot one more on Washington 17. So you will have three via points at this point. Um, so we'd have one, two, and three, and that is the way that the system is going to follow it. Once you get better at via points, you can kind of start to manipulate them more by adding via points between the origin and the first via or between point two, or sorry, before point two, before point three. But most people will just keep this as between the final via and destination. So now that I am happy with the via points I'm plotting, I'm gonna hit done. And you'll see that those are all plotted here under via points and I'm gonna click route. And once again, we are in a test site, so sometimes we do get these reload um, little messages here. So I'm just going to reload. It may make us do this again. Let's see, I get back to the route page. And we're good here. I'm going to clear us out and just really quickly throw in that lat long. And that destination again. And plot some points for you guys super quick. 
So I have my lat long. I'm just going to put this right back here in Ritzville. I'm going to hit done for my origin. My destination is once again going to be I-205. I'm going to route it super quick. And I'm going to go through and approve this restriction here on I-90 by using that get restriction information for road. I'm going to um, approve it with the reason we have test. I'm going to rerun my trip. And it's going to give me um, what it thinks is the best trip for us, but we are just going to play around with the trip again by using our add via points, find all map, and selecting the find all map hyperlink. So I'm going to use the select radio button. I am going to go and make sure I zoom in and select the roads I would prefer. have one more on Washington 17. I have three via points. I'm comfortable with what is going on here. I'm going to hit done and I'm going to route again and hopefully we won't get another reload error, but sometimes it just happens in test sites. Let's see, okay, perfect. So now we do have our preferred route happening. We have our first via, our second via, and our third via. Of course, this will all be reflected in our turn by turn directions as well. So that is one way that you can plot, uh, plot your via points. I'm going to go back up to my trip entry and I'm going to remove these and I'm going to route again just to get us back to the point that we were at previously before I um, plotted any. Okay, perfect. So now I'm just going to show you another preferred way. This can sometimes take a second to get the hang of, but once you get it, a lot of people prefer this option. Um, so I'm going to introduce you guys to something called drag route. Um, so theoretically, let's just say our origin is actually not where we wanted it to be. We actually wanted to start here on 261. I'm just going to literally grab my origin and I'm going to drag it to 261. The system will kind of snap back to where I put it. Once I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and reroute. The lat long will update here. I'm going to route because I made a change. And you'll see that the system now has me starting on 261 rather than where I was on that ramp. You'll see that in the route description and the turn by turn directions as well. We're starting off on 261 rather than that ramp on I-90. And you can also use drag route to add via points. Something to keep in mind is anytime you make a change to your route, you want to reroute. So I dragged that, I rerouted. I'm gonna go ahead and add my via points now by going in and I'm going to, let's see, how do I wanna route this? I'm just going to double click here on this blue line. That's gonna give me a via point because I double clicked on the blue line and I'm going to drag this via point over and the system is because of where I put it, it's going to obviously do some route arounds and stuff, but the system is going to try to accommodate where I'm plotting those via points. So um, obviously that area was not a super great one to plot it, but here now we have the system kind of honoring those via points. I'm going to remove this one and it'll snap back. Let's see, let's add a via point here at Washington 21. I'm going to double click the blue line. It's gonna add me a via point. I'm gonna drag it over to Washington 21. And you'll see once again, it's just accommodating the route that I am asking for. So I'm going to reroute super quick since I made some changes to the route. And you'll see once again that it is honoring that via point and routing onto 395 and then onto Washington 21. Once again, you will see that in the turn by turn driving directions as well. 
So those are some ways that you can play around with via points. They definitely take a second to get used to, but once you got it, you got it and you are um, on your way to preferred routing. So I'm going to go back up to my trip entry and I'm going to clear this route. And this next route I'm going to show you guys is going to be a split trip, dem uh, split trip demo. So with split trips, we often use these for routing around restrictions um, and getting to local roads. Obviously, a customer is going to have to get that local approval as well, um, but split trips will be a great way to route around restrictions. So for this demo, I'm going to start us off at the origin of a border crossing again, and I'm going to choose ID2 at the Oregon line. My destination is going to be a lat long that I already have. So I'm going to choose lat long and I'm just going to go ahead and plug it in there. Since I already had the lat long, I do not have to click find. So I'm happy with my origin destination and I'm going to click route. You'll see once again that we just have our origin, our destination and a blue route line. Now I'm going to go back up to trip entry and I'm going to add a split trip. You'll see that we have split one and we have our origin and destination. For my origin on split one, I'm going to go ahead and choose an intersection. I'm going to hit find intersection. And for this intersection, I want to go to Pearl and it's going to be Washington 24 and Washington 26. I'm going to hit find. So if we zoom in here, it gives us two options here. We have option one and option two. For this one, I'm just going to choose option one. We have our origin there. That looks good. I'm going to hit done. And you can see that auto populated Washington 24 and Washington 26 for my destination. I'm going to choose a lot long and I'm going to find it. And I'm going to zoom in in this area and this is just going to be a super short trip. I'm going to use my select radio button and I'm going to come across here on Washington 26. Click on the road. You're going to see my little destination. One thing you'll notice with the origin and destination on split trips is it's going to have a one and a one, a two and a two, a three and a three, so on and so forth with however many split trips you add. I'm going to hit done again. And you'll see we have our origin and destination, our split one, origin and destination. That all looks good to me. So I'm going to click route again. Okay, so now we have our first trip the blue route line and then our second trip and our blue route line. Once again, this is a one and a one. If I added another split trip, it'd be a two and a two, so on and so forth. So this is a great way to get around restrictions. If you go down to the bottom below the map, you're going to have your turn by turn driving directions and it's going to be split up by um, split trip. So this is our first trip. They would have some local roads in between that, of course, are not permitted that they'll have to get their local approvals for. And then we have our destination, um, our origin and our final destination here. So those are two um, different trips there. So that's one way you can use split trips. I'm going to go back up to our trip entry. I'm going to clear again and I'm going to confirm. Now for this next portion, I'm going to show you our min max bridges. So I'm going to choose a border crossing again. I'm going to start us off on I-5 at the BC border. I'm going to go to another border crossing as our destination and I'm going to choose I-205 and I'm going to hit route. Now, something um, that you guys I'm sure are aware of 
is that in Washington, we have um, what are called min max bridges. So these are bridges that have a minimum height and a maximum height. So with these bridges, um, if they use a certain lane, they're able to travel under them if they are in between the min and the max. So you'll see here that we have our origin and our destination. That looks great. And if you go below the map, we have below our minimum and maximum clearances. So you'll see here we have two min max bridges that we cross under in this route. You'll see them also displayed in the turn by turn driving directions. This is actually printed red on the PDF as well as there are images that I'll show you here in a moment that will also print on the PDF if we have the image for them. So I'm going to go back to um, these min max bridges. We have two that we're crossing on the route. It's going to give us our minimum height, our maximum height. There's a restrict checkbox, which I'll show you guys in a moment. We have this little image here. This is the image that will print on the PDF as long as there is an image available. If there's not an image available for whatever reason, there just won't be an image here. So this will print on the PDF. Of course, you have each lane is divided by height, um, and this is how you will know or the hauler will know which lane to pick when traveling under it. We also have under this actions option, there's a view on map. This is super, super important for you guys. If you're unaware of where this bridge is, it's just going to center you to where you're crossing under the bridge. We have the structure ID, I believe is what it is right here. And um, this will also kind of give you an idea if you want to like hop onto Google for whatever reason, you can get there. You can use our little peg man to look. And then of course we have the image there. If for whatever reason you or a hauler does not feel comfortable with a route going under the bridge, even though they are cleared to do so with the min max um, option, we do have ways to restrict that bridge. So for instance, if for whatever reason a hauler says that they actually do not feel comfortable traveling under this bridge, we can go to this little restrict checkbox and I'm going to restrict it. I've already viewed it on the map, so that'll kind of give you an idea of once we reroute if it actually did um, route around the bridge. So I viewed it on the map. I restricted it here and I'm going to go back up to the trip entry and I'm going to reroute. Now that I have rerouted, you can see that we are no longer traveling under this bridge. Instead, it's going to get us off onto some Washington roads and then back onto I-5 um, at the next applicable place to get on. So now it is um, avoiding this bridge. You'll see that as well um, with your turn by turns. It's no longer um, under the restrictions list. And then if I were go to go through and process the permit, um, you would see that it's not on the PDF as well. So that is something else to think of whenever you are dealing with min max heights. So now that I'm done with this one, I'm going to go back up to my trip entry. I'm going to hit clear. And confirm. And I have um, one more route to show you guys, and then I'll show you how you can save a trip for future use. So the next thing I'm going to show you guys is mileposts, which I think most people are very excited about, since I know that's what y'all mainly use to route in the old East Snoopy. So um, under location type, the very last option is going to be your milepost. I'm going to use an origin um, milepost, and I'm actually going to use a destination as a border crossing. So with mileposts, there's two options that you can use when um, using mileposts as a location type. The first one is exactly like lat longs. If you know where you're going and what you're doing, you can go ahead and just choose the milepost. For instance, I know on this one, I'm going to choose I-90 westbound. For milepost, I'm going to say milepost 20. My destination is going to be I-205 at the Oregon line again, and I'm just going to route. And with that, it will once again just take in um, anything that you've already given the system as far as your dimensions, et cetera. And it's going to give you a route. There's nothing um, that's going to look any different on the actual map itself when you're using a mile post. You'll just see that under the turn by turns, your origin is going to have you add a mile marker. 
Now, let's just say theoretically you don't know where you want to start. I'm going to go ahead and clear this again. Um, if you're unsure of where you want to start on a milepost, you can use the find option um, the same way that we did with lat longs. So I'm going to click find. And you'll see that we actually have a map layer that pops up. Every one of these little orange circles is a milepost. So I'm going to go ahead and I think that I want to start on I-90 westbound at milepost 20. I fill that in. I'm going to press go. From there, it's going to zoom you in to that milepost. Once again, these are all different little milepost um, circles. So it will give you a little bit of information on that location. We have our route, our direction, our milepost, and then a lat long if you want. You can also look at other little mileposts on the map. For instance, this is the eastbound direction. Um, I'm looking at this and I decided actually that my westbound milepost 20 is not where I'm going to be starting. I'm actually going to be starting at milepost 21. So I'm going to go over to milepost 21. I'm going to select the 21 and I'm going to use this select hyperlink and click that and it's going to auto populate it for me. Another thing to think of is it's going to give you the max mile post that you can select for your route, which in this case is 299.82. For my destination, once again, I'm going to use that border crossing of I-205 at the Oregon line. And I'm going to route again. And once again, nothing special happening with the actual map itself. Once you route, you're just going to see in your driving directions that you're starting at mile marker I-90 westbound at Washington 21. So um, mile posts, very simple. I know that um, a lot of people were very, very excited about that. So the last thing that I'm going to show you guys really quick before um, I look at the chat or address any questions, open it up for questions, is I'm going to show you the saved trip option. This is super, super helpful for you guys and customers if you're um, using a route that you use often. Um, I know I've spoken with a lot of haulers in the past that say that they're, you know, going to be on a months long project and every single day they're moving the same excavator from this place to this place and then there and back. So you, of course, have the option to copy a permit, but if you're not copying a permit, you can also use a saved trip option. So let's just say I travel this origin and destination often. I can go below my trip entry. There's a save trip option. So I want to save this um, for this specific one. I'm just going to give it um, today's date. 31324 demo. And I'm going to save it. From there, you'll see down here that it says success. The data was successfully saved. And now, if I were to get out of this permit and then get back into it, you could then save a trip. Of course, we have all of our little test trips and past demos, um, but you will see your save trip located under here. You would click load and then this would populate again and then you could go on for routing. So it's just another really cool feature on the site um, that I do believe a lot of people will be using. But that is all that I had as far as um, routing goes. I would, was going to go ahead and open it up for any questions that you guys might have, or if there's anything that we didn't get from the chat, I have that as well. I think the only question in the chat was about the, the county roads. But it looks okay. like Justin uh, put in a response for that. Awesome. George, I was going to see if you maybe had time to um, show how to do a uh, vehicle import. Yeah, I was going to ask um, Justin or anybody from the, the permit office, um, do we want to go ahead and show what that process is like? That does involve like logging in as a, a customer. So just wanted to see how we want to move forward on that. Yeah, I think uh, Spokane in particular, Jen had some questions with Safeway 
um, and having a large fleet and in particular Spokane area has their own Safeway yard and then we have one in Vancouver and Auburn and and kind of how it would look is importing a, a group of vehicles at once under one uh, company under a specific terminal. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen again. Um, so in, in order to import a, like a fleet of vehicles, um, you'd have to be logged into that customer's account, which I, I went ahead and uh, created a customer user for um, that company I created earlier with the DOT. Um, so I'm logged into their account now. Whenever you're logged into their account um, or whenever, you know, <laughs> you're, somebody's logged into the customer account, this is what they'll see. Um, on the left hand side, you'll have an option for uh, this vehicle import. So you click that. Um, this will bring you to a page where it kind of gives you what you need to have included on your um, vehicle inventory spreadsheet. I do have one uh, pulled up. Let me go ahead and uh, bring this over. It's a little easier to look at. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of vehicles in mind. <laughs> it sounds like. Um, the the companies that they'll be dealing with have will have significantly more vehicles but um this kind of gives you an idea of what that spreadsheet could look like there's just columns for uh all the vehicle information so unit number model year vehicle make vin license state type whatever the registered gbw is let me go ahead and um let's see yeah yeah, let me add a terminal to this company real quick, and then I'll add it to the spreadsheet. So let me add a new one. I just did Office One. And delivery method. Okay, so I'm going to add a terminal to this company. And then I'm going to add a column to my uh, inventory spreadsheet that just says Office One, so I can import all of these um, vehicles to that terminal. Save this. I'm going to go back to that vehicle. Um, so let me log out and log back in. So I want to be sure that that terminal is uh, created. Okay, so the terminal's there. Cool. And then the Terminal option here now includes that Office One. So I added that Office One to the spreadsheet, put it in this column, um, and then you can select that spreadsheet. I just have it on my desktop. Um, it's this one. I'm probably going to have to close it to actually upload it and close it. So um, it gives you a preview whenever you upload the, the spreadsheet. And it kind of lists out the information you have in the spreadsheet. And then up here, it gives you um, the option to select like which column each piece of vehicle information is in. Um, it does a pretty good job of like guessing um, how your spreadsheet is laid out. Um, so you can see unit the unit numbers in column one, and it is in my spreadsheet. The model year looks good. Vehicle make looks good. Fin is in four. The plate is in five state uh, is in six, the type is in seven. My terminal is actually in nine, so let me go ahead and change that. And then my GVW is in eight, so I'm gonna fix that too. Um, my spreadsheet has a header row, so I'm gonna change this to two because the data actually doesn't start until the second row. And once you have all that situated, you click the import sheet button. I don't have a whole lot, so it imported it pretty quickly. Um, but you can see here you get a confirmation that the vehicles were imported. If there were any failures for any reason, they'd be uh, listed here and there'd be a, a specific failure reason. So you could go back and like update your, your spreadsheet to 
to fix that and try the upload again. Um, but yeah, that's the vehicle import process. Um, since that was successful, you can see um, those five vehicles I have in my spreadsheet are uh, imported now. So that's the that's the process for importing. Um, like I said, you'll this will be uh, done on the customer side or the permit agent side um, of things.